and welcome to this review of my Decision Data 8010 keyboard. This is the oldest keyboard I own at the moment, from 1975, so 12 years older than me. This was the very old keyboard from poll number 3, and I've had it for quite a while, but now I finally get to review it. The 8010 was an interpreting data recorder, also known as a card punching machine or key punch, which is a very old way of recording data on paper. During those periods, data was often stored on punched paper tape, which had one character per row, so it stored about 3 to 4 bytes per centimeter, although the amount of actual bits per character could vary. An alternative to the tape was the use of large punched cards, which usually held 80 columns and 12 rows, of which at most 8 were used, so again, up to 1 byte per column, for a grand total of 80 bytes per card. This one, for example, reads the Fortran statement Z1 equals Y plus W1. Originally, the cards used circular cutouts and held up to 45 columns depending on the make and model, but IBM came up with the idea of using rectangular holes which could be spaced together much closer, leading to the new standard of 80 columns. The keyboard was originally completely full of hundreds of these tiny little numbered rectangles, precisely because it used these IBM type cards, as you can see on this picture. According to this Computer World article from the same year, it was part of the $16,000 Decision Data SP0010 system, which used a separate tape reader to read the paper tape, and then the 8010 punched the data onto cards to convert it into so-called Hollerith code, named after the inventor of the key punch. By 1975, 8-inch floppy disks, which apparently are still used in the US Minuteman nuclear ICBM facilities, by the way, had already been out for four years, but punched cards and tape were common in use into the 80s when it was supplanted by magnetic storage tape, similar to how VCRs and cassette tapes worked. One of the more notable things about the 8010 keyboard is that it is one of the most common and easy to obtain sources of micro switch SW series switches, also known as Honeywell Dual Magnet Hall Effect. I got this one for $88, which isn't cheap, but I've been wanting to cover one of these for quite a while now. The SW series is the predecessor to the arguably more well-known and common SD series, which uses only a single magnet, hence why the switches are popularly known as dual magnet and single magnet, or sometimes first generation and second generation Honeywell Hall effect. Although I've covered the single magnet switches before, these dual magnet ones are really different. Microswitch was the company behind the eponymous Microswitch, which is still used in a wide variety of applications, including computer mice. Although their first Microswitch was made in 1932, and their well-known V3 switch, which I'm sure you've seen before, was from 1947, the current iteration, the V7, doesn't differ much from the original design, and their yearly production in 2007 was 120 million of these Microswitches. God knows how many they make nowadays. In 1950, Microswitch was acquired by Honeywell, who are one of the largest switch manufacturers in the world, although the total amount of products they make is way too enormous to list here. They originally bought Microswitch to assist them with their heating and ventilation systems, but in 1965 developed the Hall Effect switch, which was first used in a keyboard three years later in 1968. Like this one, most SW series keyboards are from the 70s, after which they were largely supplanted by the SD single magnet switches. They have been used in a wide range of fields, but are most at home in high throughput applications and systems demanding utmost reliability, such as those employed in the military and aerospace industries. So first, for those who aren't familiar with Hall Effect switches, the Hall Effect is based on the use of magnets to divert electrons off a main path, creating a separate, transverse voltage which can be measured over a Hall element, which is a small semiconductor cell. For a more in-depth explanation on how this works, check out my ITT Courier video, which is linked in the description below. Hall effect switches are, as Honeywell puts it, solid state and don't rely on pressing electrical contacts together the way the vast majority of keyboard switches, such as Cherry MX and clone switches, Alps and many other systems do. The elimination of this inevitable rubbing action creates the potential for extremely smooth switches. They are also by far the most reliable switches I know of, and this is why they are used in such high profile applications where ultimate reliability is paramount. While most MX type switches are rated to 50 million cycles and capacitive ones to 100 million, Honeywell Hall Effect switches have a specified lifetime of 30 billion cycles. 
They even use a redundant sense line as a backup for if one of them fails. Hot damn! Both the Soviet bloc and Czechoslovakia produced their own Hall effect switches. In particular, those from Tesla were more or less direct ripoffs from Honeywell's designs. This console series keyboard, produced by Česká Zbrojovka for the Russian export market, possibly the Red Army, uses Tesla switches that are very close in design to Honeywell dual magnet switches, except these are even more over-engineered, and use four magnets instead. The advantages of Hall effect switches have inspired modern adaptations as well. Ace Partec of China do keyboards with their own simplified Hall effect switches. Although their switches don't have as high a specified lifetime, and the clicky and tactile ones in particular use a very fragile wireframe as a tactile element that gets damaged extremely easily, even during assembly. So now for the most important part, how do these dual magnet switches stuck up against the later single magnet ones? Well, they are completely different in fact. The single magnet switches clip into square cutouts in a metal mounting plate, much like modern keyboard switches, and they have a hole at the bottom to let the sensor, which is a separate element that's held PCB side, through, but they're otherwise sealed and can't be taken apart. I've mentioned before that these are actually surprisingly dependent on condition. If you get a dirty board, they can feel extremely scratchy. And because they're sealed, they're hard to clean as well. It's in fact quite challenging to even just clip them out of the mounting plate. Doing this with one of my boards, I actually damaged the plastic legs of several of the switches. By stark contrast, the dual magnet version has much larger switches that clip into a frame composed of metal loops like this, which you can very easily take off without even opening the case, let alone desoldering them, and once you've done that, the whole switch is also already disassembled. This is an absolute godsend if you want to clean out the switches quickly. In addition, I think there's a little bit more play in the parts, which results in a switch being far less susceptible to dirt and dust than the single magnet variety, without creating a large amount of wobble. Comparing this one to single magnet switches that were in similar condition, the difference is huge. These feel much smoother. Although this keyboard is, as of the moment, 43 years old and well used, it feels roughly on par in terms of smoothness with Cherry MX switches, and that's without any cleaning or lubrication. I can't imagine what these would be like when given some TLC. Like most Hall effect switches, they are linear, and the weighting is on the stiff side, which I'm not a big fan of on linear switches, but they have a certain charm to them, including a pretty firm and strangely satisfying bottom-out feeling, and a very nice deep clack sound when you press a key. They're not clicky, but the sheer size of the switches and the massive keycaps lend a lot of volume and bass to them. The travel depth is also very long, almost 5mm, which is pretty unique. Compared to Ace Partex Hall effect switches, at least a revised version of them, it's a bit hard to say, because the Honeywells are considerably stiffer and stiffness tends to amplify scratchiness, but still, I'd say the Ace Partex are smoother. I think the difference in condition does play a large part though. That said, the biggest difference between the two is probably the soundtrack, listen to this. And this is using much better caps than APTs normally come with as well. Interestingly, even though it's a very complicated switch from a technical point of view, and doubtlessly one of the most expensive to manufacture switches I've ever reviewed, particularly back in the day when semiconductors were much more expensive than they are now, it only consists of four inseparable parts, a housing, a slider, a spring, and a sensor. Of course, the slider is composed of at least four parts that I can see, including two magnets, and the sensor is a lot more complicated than most single parts as well, but it's still interesting to note. One thing it does have in common with the single magnet switches is the keycap mount and the keycaps themselves. And that's not a bad thing because I maintain they are the best keycaps ever made. They are massive chunks of double shot ABS and they're virtually indestructible. At just under 3 millimeters thick, they're the second thickest I know of after Fujitsu's epic first generation caps. 
They are twice as thick as even Cherry's own ABS double shots, now produced by GMK, which were already of a very respectable caliber, and honestly, they look awesome too. I guess Honey will figure that if you're going to make switches that last for several millennia, you better put some damn good caps on them too. These caps came in several different colors, and I even know of a pink one that reads, Who are you? Which must be one of the weirdest keyboard legends I've ever seen. One thing you'll note is that the top looks different from that of modern keycaps. The tops on these are round, which is known as spherically sculpted in keyboarding terms. This doesn't feel as nice as the modern cylindrical tops in my opinion, as the edges can dig into your fingers a bit more easily, but it looks amazing. Also, by this time they hadn't invented the homing bump, which is the little pip on the F and J keys that you can use to orient your fingers to the home row keys for touch typing. Instead, they used tops with even deeper dishes, and they didn't just apply this to the F and J keys, but to all eight home keys. One fun thing is that they used three colors to differentiate types of keys. The modifiers and special keys are black, the alpha keys are dark gray, and the number keys are light gray, although there are also examples of this model that have a white gray blue color scheme, which is admittedly considerably more kick ass. Anyway, as you can see, they even put the numbers in a function layer over the letter keys. It's an SSK, only 12 years older. In fact, although the layout is really rather random, something that was pretty common until IBM set a standard with a PC keyboard in 1981, at a glance and with some rebinding, you can make a pretty decent layout out of this, I think. And it's very small, proving that you could get 60% keyboards as early as the 1970s. While everyone always tends to think old keyboards were humongous pieces of work, which, in fact, is only true about 98% of the time. The keyboard weighs 2.3 kilos, which is very hefty, but not as heavy as the Kish Saver, so that one retains its record status in the 60% category at 2.8. The build is thick plastic for the entirety of the case, and it uses a sensing assembly which has metal everywhere. Overall, it's excellent. It also comes with these three little levers here, which did god knows what. To be honest, if I ever somehow got this keyboard working, I would probably just play with these all day long, because they're super awesome. Can you imagine how satisfying it would be to have one of these as a caps lock key? You just go... <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> Unfortunately, as I said, I can't use it because the, by the way, absolutely ridiculous cable, which is over a centimeter thick, comes with this insane plug that I don't even know where to start with, and I'd be surprised if it ran on the standard 5 volt, but it's really fun to toy around with, it looks awesome, and the key feel and sound is very cool. Again, considering it's not even that big, I think it'd make a cool and even quite usable 60%, if you like ISO, that is. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.